great. Uh, good morning. Thanks for this opportunity to share some of our thoughts on hereditary colorectal cancers and when you should send the patient for genetic referral. I have no disclosures. So I'll pose a scenario to you. 70-year-old female with newly diagnosed sigmoid cancer. Pathology is consistent. You've done the operation. No metastatic disease. The question now is, should you initiate genetic workup or referral for a 70-year-old? I'll change this to a 60-year-old or a 30-year-old. So intuitively, you might have some sense that maybe the youngest patients should have a genetic workup or referral. And I'm going to present some algorithms, some thoughts about this in terms of how you approach it. So familial and hereditary colorectal cancers, what do those terms really mean? Well, this is really a distribution of what cancers are. The majority of colorectal cancers are what we say sporadic. They occur with a spontaneous mutation. But there's actually a proportion of these cancers probably increasing now that we're realizing are actually genetic in origin. Things like hereditary cancers, which are less than 5%, or what we call familial cancers. This patient has a family member who has colorectal cancer. They might have something that's familial. Now, we know a lot more about hereditary cancers, okay? And this is actually increasing. And, you know, there's a whole chart here that goes over some of these cancers, things that you're familiar with. The most common one, Lynch syndrome. This is probably about 3 to 4% of this group. And this is a non-polyposis syndrome. It's autosoma dominant with affecting mismatch repaired genes. Then we can go into the polyposis syndromes. You've also heard of these, things like FAP, familiar adenomatous polyposis, attenuated FAP, MAP syndrome, which is really the recessive form of FAP, and then even this really kind of unusual one, which is the polymerase proofreading associated polyposis, extremely rare genetic syndrome. Then you go to some of these hematomas, poos jager syndrome, juvenile polyposis, Cowden syndrome, okay? These are all rare. We're not going to go into the details for these. And then there's some other strange ones too, serrated polyposis syndrome that you might be hearing. But this talk isn't going to be about these specific syndromes, but I just want to go over those to put in your mind. Because the question is, when do you get concerned about some of these disease processes? And of course, people have thought about this. There are guidelines that are out there that you can easily pull up. Some of these are done by the U.S. Multi-Society Task Force, the Gastroenterology Society, and then, as Dr. Contreras has spoken earlier, about the NCCN clinical practice guidelines. And I would stress the most important thing is to have a one single source, as I tell all the trainees, to go to, because there's so many details that are out there now that's hard to remember everything. So this is the one that I tend to use. And this, was just, this is actually the most updated version, um, 2016. And really it breaks down into a strategy of when, do you, when you see this patient, when do you get concerned? Well, I think, number one, first, you have to, have, uh, you have to be concerned. You, ha you have to be alerted to this. Something has to trigger a red flag in your mind that you are now on guard and you are thinking that could there be something genetic going on. Once that trigger is placed in your mind, then it's pretty straightforward. You refer to genetics. They can continue the specific workup because you might not remember what gene it is, but they'll do the testing. They can do the counseling. They have a whole algorithm that they can follow. And then once the diagnosis is made, there's a whole management style that can be done for that diagnosis. But today, we're going to be talking mainly about alert. How do you get triggered in terms of being worried? When should you start thinking about this workup and referral? Well, I go back a little bit into history in talking about this familial and hereditary colorectal cancer because it's all fairly new. 1966, Dr. Lynch first suspected there might, there might be mutations going on that might be driving cancer, really in two families that he was looking at. This was in the 60s. But this was all based on clinical suspicion. 20 years later, the first gene was really found, the FAP syndrome, um, was found in the APC gene. So this mutation was located. So it was proven that one single mutation in a gene can cause a cancer syndrome. So that's pretty remarkable. So in 1991, this is when the Amsterdam criteria, the first one, came out. And this is the, what we teach all the medical students, the 3 2 one rule. Okay, this came out in 91. And then, lo and behold, two years later, the first gene was found, the mutation in MSH2 that was related to Lynch syndrome. So Dr. Lynch was correct. There was a gene mutation here, finally identified. Now, the Amsterdam criteria was pretty strict. You had to get all three of these, so it missed a lot of patients. So then folks met in Bethesda and widened the criteria and said, well, maybe it's not just colorectal cancer. Maybe if you have Lynch-related cancers, like the number two cancer, which is endometrial cancer, maybe if you have any of these, you might have a syndrome. Maybe you should be tested more. So that was 97. Amsterdam revised this in, uh, for the second version in 1999, also following the Bethesda, expanding out the number type of cancers to be concerned about. And then 2004, Bethesda 2 criteria came out. So these are all clinical criteria. 
So the NCCN is great because they synthesize all of this information into the guidelines in 2016. And as you can see, there's tons of text on here. It's very hard to read. But the flow that we're going to follow through is this number, this first block here, the criteria for further risk, risk evaluation for these syndromes. And I'm going to break this down uh, into how I kind of uh, conceptualize this. Really, there's four parts to this. So for the guidelines, when do you get concerned? Number one, there's a known mutation in the family. That's a no-brainer. The family tells you, actually, my father had Lynch syndrome. You should be concerned, OK? So that's pretty obvious. All right, number two, colorectal cancer and greater than 10 adenomas on colonoscopy. So this is important because FAP, everyone can probably see that. That's over 100 polyps. If you've ever seen a colon with FAP, it is remarkable, thousands of polyps. Um, attenuated FAP is less. It's less than 100 polyps, OK? But this is, this is stressing that if you have more than 10 adenomas in the colon and there's a colorectal cancer, there, you should be worried that there's something genetic going on. Okay, so that's number two. The third one out of four here is you have colorectal cancer and endometrial cancer. Again, endometrial is important because that's the number two cancer for Lynch. You have that and you're less than 50 years old. And this is really a result of all the Amsterdam, Bethesda. You'll see this common theme. People less than 50, you got to get worried. But then there's this other part, Lynch-related factors. So this is, these are patients now with um, either testing that's positive for genetic defects, or they have Lynch-related cancers, or they have these family histories, as you see here, first-degree relatives, second-degree relatives. I highlight in red, though, something that um, uh, probably not a lot of people use, but there's something called a PREEM score, the one through six score. This is actually really neat, and I'm going to show a little bit more about this, because if this, is, this is an online, web-based, free, you just type in a couple uh, pieces of information about a patient and their family history, and you get, a, you get a percent, a score, that tells you the chances of this patient having Lynch. And anything over 5%, you should be worried about. So that should trigger further genetic workup and counseling. So these first three seem pretty straightforward. You can remember these. But then the fourth one's really interesting. This is the patient who actually doesn't have colorectal cancer or endometrial. Now, this is someone that might not come to a surgeon, okay? But this is out there, too, because these are patients who have also as you see, Lynch-related factors, family histories, or really strange phenotypes, okay? And when I mean strange phenotypes, I mean someone comes to you to see you for a desmoid tumor, okay? Or a papillary thyroid cancer, that's unusual, or a hepatoblastoma. These are part of those other syndromes I talked about, the Cowden syndrome. These are kind of the rare ones. But again, I highlight in red that there's something called a PREEM score, uh, which is really important that can actually help kind of go through all these texts that I'm telling you right now. You just punch in these numbers, and it gives you a number. So this is it. This is the PREEM 126 score. It's really developed um, within the Harvard system. Now it's on the Dana-Farber site. There's a website there. But it's really just, really just one, one page, essentially. There's proband information. You punch in some information about the patient. And then you punch in some information about first degree and second degree relatives. And then voila, you get a number. And if it's over 5%, that should be a red alert in your mind. So I've gone over the alert. When should you start thinking about genetic referral? I think my answer is, well, go to the NCCN. They have a great summary of the synthesizing all this information over the last several decades. Um, and hopefully I've broken it up into a framework for you in terms of the four ways to think about it, because that's really what the, all these little texts talk about. And then once this triggers the alert, then NCCN is great. It also tells you actually what you know, send to genetic counseling. And then it tells you once you get the diagnosis of a syndrome, you can learn more about the syndrome. Because within each syndrome, you have to worry about surveillance, when do you start surveillance, and then how to treat, and even prophylaxis. Like, when can you do prophylactic surgery for these patients? Like FAP, you know, we would do a total proctocolectomy. Um, so those are the kind of questions that you can learn more about uh, on this site. Now, a special word about Lynch syndrome, because this is the one we understand the most about. So Lynch syndrome, the, tr the traditional strategy, if we use this as a prototype, was that, well, if you have a clinical criteria that was filled, like Amsterdam or Bethesda, someone with uterine cancer, you would send them to genetic counseling, and they would do further tests. The problem is you miss a lot of patients with, based on clinical-based screening. And so this is kind of a summary that shows you some of the percentages that people have calculated with the various tests that are out there. But the bottom line is all of these have suboptimal sensitivity, meaning if you have Lynch syndrome, this test uh, could miss you, all right? And we want to avoid that if we can, as we're seeing more and more young patients with colorectal cancers. So there's a philosophy that's out there that you'll hear about, uh, about universal testing or selective testing. Universal testing, it's, it's kind of radical, okay? But it means that all colorectal cancer cases you get, you have the tissue, you send that off for testing for Lynch syndrome. 
And the idea is that maximizes the sensitivity. You're going to catch everybody, presumably. And it simplifies care process. You don't have to think about the criteria. Is it 50? Is it 70? Do they have endometrial? You just send it, and it gets tested. And this is actually recommended by multiple societies, uh, most recently by the NCCN in 2016, and including all the other ones I listed here. The catch, though, and I add that asterisk, is that you need an infrastructure to handle this. Yes, on paper, sure, why not? We send it all. But there's costs associated with this. You need a genetic counselor. If you're in a small hospital, you might not have the ability to do all this, and you need your pathologist on board also. So that's why people have this other idea of selected criteria. This is the, some people call it the Jerusalem criteria, developed by a group there, where maybe you don't test everybody, you just test all colorectal cancers that are less than 70. Okay? And then anyone who's older than 70, if they fulfill one of those criteria, the Bethesda criteria, you can send this off. And there's some recent cost-effective analysis uh, on this uh, that are saying that this may be more cost-effective, but and the NCCN actually says that this is also a reasonable approach uh, for these patients. Um, here at UAB, we have a department of genetics that can get appointments uh, that we can refer folks to uh, when uh, we get this trigger in our mind. So in summary, I think familial cancers uh, take up, you know, a third of colorectal cancers. Hereditary cancers, which means that we have an identified gene, right now is about 5%. But I suspect this is going to increase more and more as we get better at understanding the, uh, the, the genetics behind uh, these cancers and uh, as we increase our testing capabilities. Um, know that there are clinical criteria on the NCCN website. I would highly recommend going there and book, uh, linking to that. And when this trigger happens, you should send for genetics referral because they can really help with further evaluations. Uh, for Lynch, which is the most common hereditary cancer, there's both universal and selected testing philosophies that are out there. Um, so it'll be interesting to talk about kind of what, what, what your institution does. And, but the most importantly, as Dr. Kennedy has shown in his slides, even though the incidence is decreasing for many patients, it's the young patients right now that we're seeing increasing amounts. And I think we can all in our practice remember those 30-year-olds who come in with metastatic colorectal cancers, and, and we're seeing more of them. Bottom line, just keep in your mind, consider familiar hereditary cancers uh, uh, whenever you uh, uh, treat, uh, manage a patient with this uh, disease process. Um, it adds another level of thinking, I think, to management. It's not just surgery anymore. You've got to think about this in the background. And uh, for the trainees, this is important. On my oral boards and surgery in San Diego, uh, this is actually a total question, okay? They were testing me to see if I would send a patient for Lynch testing who was younger than 50. So I think we're going to see a lot more of this.